and book refers to the different felonies. So the first among these, Title I, Crimes Against National Security. Under Article 114, we have treason. Treason is committed by any Filipino citizen or an alien residing in the Philippines who in times of war in which the Philippines is involved either levies war against the Philippine government or adheres to the enemies by giving them aid or comfort. The elements of treason are first, that the offender is either a Filipino citizen or an alien residing in the Philippines. Second, that there is a war in which the Philippines is involved. And third, that the offender either levies war against the Philippine government or adheres to the enemies by giving them aid or comfort. The first element refers to the offender. The offender in prison can either be a Filipino citizen, one who owes permanent allegiance to the Philippine government, or a foreigner, an alien residing in the Philippines. During his stay in the Philippines, he owes temporary allegiance to the Philippine government. The second element provides that there must be a war in which the Philippines is involved. So treason is a wartime offense. Treason can only be committed in times of war. Supreme Court said that in times of peace, treason remains to be dormant. However, the moment war erupts, the moment emergency arises, treason is immediately put into effect as an act of self-defense, self-preservation of the state. Treason can only be committed in times of war because it is only in times of war that there are traitors. Treason is an act of self-defense by the state against traitors to the state. <clears throat> the third element provides for the modes of committing treason. The offender either levies war against the Philippine government or adheres to the enemies by giving them aid or comfort. Levying war against the Philippine government requires the concurrence of two elements. First, there must be an actual assembly of men. And second, it is for the purpose of effecting a reasonable design by force. So here, it is necessary that the offender wanting to commit treason against the Philippine government connives or conspire with the enemy troops in order to hand over the Philippine government. The second mode of committing treason is by adhering to the enemies, giving them aid or comfort. When you say adherence to the enemies, it means the offender intellectually and emotionally favors the enemy. How is this established? It is established by his act of giving aid or comfort to the enemy. Therefore, the adherence and the act of giving aid or comfort must concur with each other because the giving of aid or comfort is the manifestation of the offender's adherence to the enemies. When in times of war, in which the Philippines is involved, the said offender gives or gives the enemy weapons, arms, means of transportation, valuable information regarding the tactics of the Philippine government. This all reveals that the intent of the said offender is to commit reason in order to strengthen the defense of the enemy and to weaken the defense of the Philippines. If in the course of the committing of the act of committing treason, the offender would commit common crimes. The offender would kill fellow Filipinos, would burn houses in a certain community. All in furtherance of his act of committing treason, the commission of these common crimes are absorbed in the crime of treason. Therefore, the crime committed is only treason. No separate and distinct charge for murder, for arson, for physical injury. If there are two ways of committing treason, there are also two ways of proving treason. Treason can be proven, first, through the testimony of at least two witnesses to the same overt act, this otherwise known as the two witness rule. And the other one is by the open court testimony. Open court, confession of guilt on the part of the accused. The first mode of proving treason requires that there must be at least two witnesses to the commission of the same overt act by the offender, charge of treason. These two witnesses must corroborate each other as the act performed by the said offender. Therefore, treason cannot be committed or cannot be proven 
by mere circumstantial evidence. The law requires there must be direct evidence. The law requires there must be at least two witnesses. The second mode of proving treason is by the offender's confession of guilt, admission of guilt made in open court. So it is a judicial admission or confession of guilt, not an extrajudicial admission of guilt. There is conspiracy to commit treason when two or more persons come to an agreement concerning the commission of treason and they decide to commit it. There is proposal to commit treason when a person has decided to commit treason and he proposes his execution to another. Both of these must occur in times of war in which the Philippines is involved. So conspiracy and proposal are also crimes in times of war in which the Philippines is involved. Mistration of treason is committed by any Filipino citizen who in times of war in which the Philippines is involved would have knowledge of a conspiracy to commit treason but he fails to disclose the same to the authorities as soon as possible. If treason is committed both by a Filipino citizen and a foreigner, misquestion of treason is exclusive to Filipino citizens. Misquestion of treason can be committed only by one who owes permanent allegiance to the Philippine government. It cannot be committed by a foreigner who owes only temporary allegiance during his stay in the Philippines. The crime will arise if there is a war in which the Philippines is involved and this offender has knowledge of a conspiracy to commit reason, but he kept the same to himself. He did not disclose it. He did not divulge it to the authorities as soon as possible. For failure to disclose it, he becomes criminally liable for misprision of reason. There are two ways of committing espionage. First, by entering any warship, fort, naval, military establishment, or reservation without authority, therefore, for the purpose of obtaining any information, plans, photographs, or other data of a confidential nature relative to the defense of the Philippines. Or, by revealing to a representative of a foreign nation the contents of the articles, data, or other information of a confidential nature relative to the defense of the Philippines which he has in his possession by reason of the public office that he holds. These are the two ways of committing espionage. Under the first mode of committing espionage, the offender can be any person. He can be a Filipino citizen, he can be a foreigner, he can be a public officer or employee, he can be a private individual. The crime will arise the moment he enters any warship port naval without authority. And what was his intent? To obtain classified information relative to the defense of the Philippines. The mere fact that he enters these forbidden places without authority, the law presumes his intention was to obtain classified information. Therefore, he becomes liable for espionage. Under the second mode of committing espionage, this can only be committed by a public officer or employee who has been entrusted with this classified information relative to the defense of the Philippines. The crime will arise if he would disclose, if he would reveal this information to any representative of a foreign nation. Espionage can be committed both in times of peace and in times of war. Inciting to war and giving motives for crisis, this is committed when the offender performs an act which is unauthorized by the Philippine government, and the said act provoke or give occasion for war, involving or liable to involve the Philippines, or expose Filipino citizens to reprisals on their persons or property. So the offender performs unlawful acts, unauthorized acts, by the Philippine government. And the effect of the performance of these acts, it will provoke the Philippines to enter into war, or it will cause their prices on the persons, on the property of fellow Filipinos in other countries. He becomes liable for inciting to war. As the name states, there is yet no war. Therefore, it is committed in times of peace, but because of this offender's act, the Philippines may enter into war, may involve itself into war. Violation of neutrality is committed 
when there is a war, but the Philippines is not a party to the said war. And there is a regulation issued by competent authority and force neutrality. And the offender violates the said regulation and force neutrality. Even if there is a war between two countries in which the Philippines is involved, if there is no regulation coming from competent authority that we should enforce neutrality, then anyone can side with any country without being liable for violation of neutrality. The essence of the crime is the violation of the said declaration, of the said proclamation issued by competent authority that enforces neutrality. When the state says we should stay neutral, then we should stay neutral. Otherwise, if one sided with another country, then he becomes liable for violation of neutrality. Correspondence with hostile country is committed when there is a war in which the Philippines is involved. And the offender makes correspondence with the enemy country or any territory occupied by the enemy troops. And the said making of correspondence is either prohibited by the Philippine government, carried out in ciphers or conventional signs, or it contains notice or information which may be useful to the enemy. If the Philippines is into war with a foreign country and there is a declaration coming from competent authority that prohibits the making of correspondence, any kind of correspondence with the enemies will already give rise to the crime. Even if it is an innocent correspondence, the crime will already arise. But if there is no prohibition coming from the Philippine government, the crime will only arise if the said correspondence is carried out in ciphers and conventional signs, which may be useful to the enemy. And the last one is flight to enemy country. Flight to enemy country is committed again. There is a war in which the Philippines is involved. The offender owes allegiance to the Philippine government, and the offender attempts to flee, to go to the enemy state. And there is a prohibition coming from the Philippine government for anyone going or fleeing to the enemy state. So again, there must be a regulation coming from competent authority which prohibits the act of going to the enemy state. Absent that proclamation or declaration, the crime will not arise. The law says it is committed by one who owes allegiance to the Philippine government. He can either be a Filipino citizen or a foreigner. Both owes allegiance to the Philippine government. It is not required that he owes permanent allegiance to the Philippine government. Then we go to crimes. <coughs> In, we are finished with crimes against national security and then we have crimes against the law of nations. Crimes against the law of nations, we have only four crimes. We have piracy, qualified piracy, mutiny, and qualified mutiny. Piracy under Article 122 of the Revised Penal Code is committed when the following elements are present. First, that the vessel is on the high seas or in Philippine waters. Second, that the offenders are not members of the complement or passengers of the vessel. Third, that the offenders either seize or attack the vessel or seize in whole or in part the cargo, the equipment, or the personal belongings inside the said vessel. So in case of piracy under Article 122, the vessel can either be on the high seas or on Philippine waters. The offenders must be coming from the outside. The offenders must not be insiders to the vessel. The offenders must not be members of the complement or passengers of the vessel. And the third element provides for the modes of committing piracy. The, event, the offender can either attack or seize the vessel itself. Or, the offender can seize in whole or in part the cargo, the equipment, the personal belongings inside the said vessel. Based on the manner of committing piracy, piracy is akin to robbery because it is committed with violence against or intimidation of persons or use of force upon things and there is, on the part of the offender, intent to gain. Under Article 123, Piracy is qualified by the presence of any of the following circumstances. So, piracy is qualified when it is committed but it is attended 
by any of the following circumstances, therefore, the crime committed is qualified piracy. First, whenever the offenders have seized a vessel by boarding or firing upon the sea. Second, whenever the pirates have abandoned their victims without means of saving themselves. And lastly, whenever the crime is accompanied by murder, homicide, physical injuries, or rape. Any of these circumstances will qualify piracy, so the crime committed is qualified piracy. The first qualifying circumstance, whenever the offenders have seized a vessel by boarding or firing upon the scene. For piracy to be qualified under the first circumstance, it is necessary that the vessel itself must be the one seized. So if only the personal belongings were seized, even if there was boarding, even if there was fighting, it is not qualified piracy. Because the law says, whenever the offenders have seized a vessel by boarding or firing upon the sea. Under the second qualifying circumstance, after committing the acts of piracy, the offenders abandoned their victims without means to save themselves, without means of surviving. From piracy, it becomes qualified piracy. And under the last qualifying circumstance, whenever piracy is accompanied by murder, homicide, physical injuries, or rape. Physical injuries here may be of any kind. The law did not specify. Therefore, whatever be the kind of physical injuries, serious, less serious, or slight, for as long as it accompanies the commission of piracy, it will become qualified piracy. Whenever murder, homicide, physical injuries, or rape would be present in the commission of the piracy, these are not distinct crimes by themselves. These are considered as circumstances which will qualify the crime of piracy. Hence, they are absorbed because they are the qualifying circumstances. The crime committed is only qualified piracy. There is no separate and distinct charge for murder, for homicide. Likewise, you do not come next year. There is no crime as qualified piracy with murder. How about mutiny? Under Article 122, mutiny is committed when the following elements are present. First, that the vessel is on the high seas or in Philippine waters. Second, that the offenders are members of the complement or passengers of the vessel. And lastly, that the said offenders create a disturbance or commotion on board a ship against the command of a superior authority. In case of mutiny, it's just the same that the vessel is on the high seas or Philippine waters. In so far as the offenders, however, are concerned, in case of mutiny, it is inside that the offenders are insiders to the vessel. The offenders are the members of the crew, the members of the complement, or the passengers of the vessel itself. And how is mutiny committed? The offender creates a disturbance, a commotion on board the vessel against the local authority of, a superior, of the superior authority, that is, the captain of the said vessel. Based on, the, based on the mode of committing mutiny, mutiny is akin to sedition. It is a protest, a disturbance, a commotion against the command, the local command of superior authority. What about the circumstances that will qualify mutiny? Although Article 123 did not enumerate any, of any circumstances that will qualify mutiny, the beginning of Article 123 provides that it applies to the crimes in the preceding article. And the crimes in the preceding articles are piracy and mutiny. Therefore, Article 123 also applies to mutiny. And according to legal luminaries, of the three qualifying circumstances enumerated in qualified piracy, the last two will qualify mutiny. Therefore, whenever the mutineers would abandon their victims, without means of saving themselves, and whenever the crime of mutiny is accompanied by murder, homicide, physical injuries, or rape. These two qualifying circumstances would apply to mutiny, crime committed is qualified mutiny. There was this um, vessel, it was a um, 
it was a vessel registered in Panama. And the vessel was in Apari, Cagayan. While the vessel was in Apari, Cagayan, suddenly the, the uh, captain of the ship felt that something was wrong with, with the vessel. And so the said vessel was stopped, placed an anchor, and then thereafter, the crew tried to repair the said vessel. They were tired thereafter, so the officers and the members fell asleep. While they were fast asleep, here comes a motorboat. On the said motorboat, five men alighted. And these five men took away part of the cargoes and the equipment of the said vessel and loaded it on the motorboat and off they left. What crime has been committed by the said five men? The five men are liable of piracy. All the elements of piracy under Article 122 are present first. The vessel is on Philippine waters. Second, the offenders are not members of the complement. They are outsiders from the vessel. And lastly, the offenders took in part the cargo and equipment in the said vessel. So these five men are liable of piracy under Article 122 of the RPC. Let us add facts. What if at the time that the said um, officers and members of the group were fast asleep, these five men entered and they took they took the par part of the cargo and equipment and loaded it on their motorboat. Thereafter, they placed an explosive device in the said vessel. And the moment their motorboat were in a safe place, they detonated the said explosive device. The hull of the said vessel was severely damaged and as a result, five members of the crew died and 15 others were seriously wounded. What crime or crimes had been committed by these five men? The five men are liable of qualified piracy under Article 120. The elements of piracy are all present. The vessel is on Philippine waters. The offenders came from the outside. They are not members of the complement or passengers of the vessel. And they took in part the cargo and equipment of the vessel. However, it becomes qualified piracy under Article 123 because it was accompanied by murder, the act of placing an explosive device, and then thereafter they detonated it, killing five members of the crew that amounted to murder. Likewise, physical injuries because others were seriously wounded. So it is qualified piracy under Article 123. There is only one crime committed qualified piracy. Even if five members of the crew died, even if 15 others were seriously wounded, this will not constitute separate and distinct charges of murder, separate and distinct charges of serious physical injuries, because they are the very circumstances that qualify the crime of piracy. So only one crime, and that is qualified piracy. But what if this vessel was, the vessel was sailing, and while the vessel was sailing, it was already nearing the shore when five members of the crew of the vessel and other passengers of the vessel, numbering in five also, collide and conspire with one another in order to take away part of the cargo and equipment of the vessel. And so the moment the said vessel went to the shore, these ten men, five members of the crew and five passengers, at knife point, they took part of the cargo and equipment, put it out of the vessel, and then loaded it in another means of transportation. What crime has been committed by these five members of the crew and five passengers of the vessel? They are also liable of piracy. But it is no longer piracy under Article 122. It is not piracy under Article 122 because in Article 122 piracy, the law requires that the offenders must not be members of the complement or passengers of the vessel. In the problem, the offenders themselves were passengers and members of the crew. Hence, it cannot be considered as piracy under Article 122. But the crime committed is still piracy. It is piracy under PD 532, the anti-piracy law of 1974. Supreme Court
Court said, despite the amendment of Article 122, Piracy by R. in 759, PD 532 remains to be a good law. It has not been repealed and it will apply if the vessel is on Philippine waters and acts of piracy were committed not by strangers to the vessel but by the members of the complement and passengers of the vessel. Under PD 532, the anti piracy law of 1974, Piracy refers to any seizure or attack of the vessel, or the seizure in whole or in part of the cargo or equipment in the said vessel, irrespective of the value thereof, committed by means of violence against or intimidation of persons by any person, including members of the complement or passengers of the vessel while the vessel is on Philippine waters. So if Article 122 would not apply, and the vessel is on Philippine waters, Article 122 would not apply because the offenders committing piracy are the members of the court itself, then it is PD 532, under PD 532, the anti-piracy law of 1974. May nag-lecture na ng special penal laws, right? See, the, the lecture on hijacking, tapos na yun. So we go to, we also lectured on our space. Human Security Act, Terrorism. So we go to Title 2 now. Title 2, that is Crimes Against the Fundamental of the State Art of the RPC. Under Title 2, Crimes Against the Fundamental of the State, we have arbitrary detention. Old times in the bar. The question in the objectives, what are the three kinds of arbitrary detention? The three kinds of arbitrary detention are first, under Article 124, arbitrary detention by detaining a person without legal ground. Under Article 125, arbitrary detention by failure to deliver detained person to the proper judicial authorities within 12, 18, or 36 hours. And lastly, under Article 126, arbitrary detention by failing to release a retained person <coughs> despite a judicial or executive order to do so. These are the three ways of committing arbitrary detention. So we have Article 124, Article 125, and Article 126. They are all arbitrary detention. Under Article 124, we have arbitrary detention by detaining a person without legal ground. The elements of arbitrary detention under Article 124 are first, that the offender is a public officer or employee. Second, that he detains another. And last element, does the detention is without legal ground. The offender in arbitrary detention is a public officer vested with authority to effect arrest and detain a person. Even if the said offender is a public officer and he detain another, if he is not one vested with authority to effect arrest and detain another, the crime committed is not arbitrary detention, but it could either be serious illegal detention under Article 267 or is slight illegal detention under Article 268. So in order to amount to arbitrary detention, it is necessary that the offender is a public officer entrusted with the authority to effect arrest and detain another. Second element requires he detains another. There is detention when there is a manifest intent to deprive the person of his liberty. Evidently, there is a manifest intent to deprive the said person of his liberty. And the third element requires that the detention is without legal grounds. Detention is said to be without legal grounds if the arrest and detention is not based on a warrant of arrest. If the arrest and detention does not fall under any of the circumstances for a valid warrantless arrest. Or if the person arrested and detained is not suffering from any disease, sickness, violent insanity, which requires compulsory confinement. These are the so-called not legal grounds for detention. How about arbitrary detention under Article 125? Under Article 125, arbitrary detention is committed when the following elements are present. Again, the offender is a public officer or employee. Second, 
that he arrests and detains another based on legal grounds. Third, that he fails to deliver the detained person to the proper judicial authorities within 12 hours for crimes punishable by life penalties or their equivalent, within 18 hours for crimes punishable by correctional penalties or their equivalent, or within 36 hours for crimes punishable by afflictive penalties or capital punishment or their equivalent. These are the elements of arbitrary detention under Article 125. The offender is the same. He must be a public officer vested with the authority to effect arrest and detain another. But the second element requires that he arrests and detains another based on legal grounds. So in case of arbitrary detention under Article 124, at the outset, the crime is committed. Because under Article 124, the arrest and detention is without legal grounds. But in Article 125, the arrest and detention at the outset is legal. The arrest and detention is legal because it is based on circumstances for valid warrantless arrest. The crime will only arise if after arresting the said person, the public officer fails to deliver him to the proper judicial authorities within the period required by law. It is only then that the crime of arbitrary detention will arise. When you say delivery to the proper judicial authorities, it means the filing of the proper case before the proper court. And this delivery must be made to the judicial authorities. These are the judges and courts of justices established by law that is from the lowest court, the municipal trial court, to the highest court, the Supreme Court. And the period is provided for 12, 18, or 36 hours for their equivalence. The fact that the law says for their equivalent, it means that Article 125 would apply even if the person arrested by the public officer has committed a crime in violation of a special penal law. So this will not only apply the duty of any public officer to bring to the proper authorities to file a case against the person arrested would only apply not only in case of violation of the RPC but also in case of violation of special penal law. Under Article 126, there is the third kind of arbitrary detention. The elements are first, the offender is a public officer or employee. Second, there is a judicial or executive order for the release of a prisoner. And, or for the release of a prisoner, or there is a proceeding upon a petition for the liberation of a prisoner. And the third element, the offender without any legal ground, without any legal reason, and duly delays either the service of notice of this judicial executive order, the performance of this judicial executive order for the release of a prisoner, or he unduly delays the said proceedings upon a petition for the liberation of a prisoner. So here, it is the non-compliance with an order coming from the judicial authorities or the executive authorities for the release of a prisoner that will make the public officer criminally liable. It is necessary, however, that his non-compliance must be without any legal ground, without any justifiable ground. The accused was charged with the accused was charged with two crimes. He was charged with illegal sale of dangerous drugs. And he was also charged with illegal possession of dangerous drugs. He was caught in the act of selling drugs, and on the palm of his hands, there were two plastic sachets of shabu. So he was charged with illegal sale. When he was brought to the police station and he was frisked and told to remove his clothing, five plastic sachets were found inside his socks. So he was also charged with illegal possession of dangerous drugs. So these two cases were both filed with a court, and these two cases were raffled to two different courts. Illegal sale of dangerous drugs was raffled to RPC Branch 83. Illegal possession of dangerous drugs was raffled to RPC Branch 6. The fiscal failed to move for the consolidation of these cases, and so both cases raffled to different courts and sued its hearings. Insofar as the illegal possession case is concerned, 
which is being tried by RTC-6, despite subpoena, the arresting police officers and the forensic chemist failed to appear. And so, because of that, the defense counsel moved for the dismissal of the case, and the judge, with the consent of the set accused, provisionally dismissed the case. And with this comes the order of release of the said prisoner. The said prisoner was released, uh, was, uh, was placed behind bars because of these cases. And so, the RTC judge provisionally dismissed the case, and at the order, the judge stated that this accused must be immediately released. The jail, the jail warden was in possession of this order coming from the court. However, despite receipt of the said order, the jail warden did not release the prisoner X. Is the jail warden liable for arbitrary detention under Article 126? He failed to comply with a judicial order. It is an order coming from the court, a judicial authority, ordering the release of this prisoner X. Is he liable under Article 126? He is not liable under Article 126 because the third element is absent. What the third element requires is that there is no valid reason for non-compliance with the said judicial executive order. In this case, the jail warden has a valid reason for not complying with a judicial executive order because this accused ex is facing another case being tried under RTC 83 and that is illegal sale which happens to be a non-bailable offense. Therefore, the said non-compliance is for a justifiable legal ground. Hence, he cannot be liable for violation of Article 126 arbitrary detention. What if the police officers caught X in flagrante delicto, killing Y in the course of a fight, and the police officers got X to the police station? After investigation, after taking his um, photographs, taking matches and fingerprints of X, X was placed behind bars. However, since the said incident happened on a Friday night, the following day, courts were closed, so they were not able to file the case. Sunday, courts were also closed, they were not able to file the case. There was a declaration coming from the president that Monday is a special non-working holiday, so also they were not able to file the case before the court. So these arresting police officers filed the case against X before the fiscal's office for inquest proceedings on Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock. After inquest, the fiscal found probable cause. The fiscal immediately filed the case before the proper court. But it was way beyond the 36-hour limit under Article 125. And because of that, the counsel of the accused filed against the arresting police officers arbitrary detention under Article 125. Are the police officers liable as charged? The police officers are liable as charged. They filed the complaint before the fiscal's office and the fiscal filed the complaint or the information before the proper court within the regulatory period provided for by law. The 12, 18, and 36 hours do not run during those times where in courts are closed and could not receive this information or complaint. The 12, 18, and 36 hours only run during those times that courts and the Office of the Public Prosecutors are open to receive these complaints, to receive this information or filing of cases. Hence, the said case was filed within the period of time. The police officers are not liable for arbitrary detention. Under Article 127, the law punishes expulsion. Expulsion is committed when the following elements are present. The offender is a public officer or employee. Second, he expels a person from the Philippines or compels him to change his place of residence. And lastly, he is not authorized by law to do so. It is necessary that the public officer involved here is not authorized by law. Even though not authorized by law, he expels a person from the Philippines or compels him to change his place of residence. 
If this act of expulsion is done by the officer of the DID as an alter ego of the president, then he is authorized by law. If this is done by a judge who has convicted the accused of the crime of, of, of a crime or in the penalties this general, he is not liable. Because they are public officers who are authorized by law to expel a person from the Philippines or to compel him to change his place of residence. Under Article 128, the law punishes violation 